Here's a few circuit diagrams which we found in one of the service books here, which we supply on eBay and our website. A lot of service data you can find up there in our library. Here's a Deca Decalion, which has the six V6 power output tubes. We'll go through that at a later stage, along with a 6L6 and a PX4 circuit diagrams. This one we're looking at is a Deca Decola, and it's a PX25 push-pull amplifier um, using L63s and the 5U4G rectifier valve. Here's Phil Moss, a service technician, who can take you through the circuit diagram. Right, Deca Decola. It says record player, but actually this has an input for a radio, and the radio in the Decola is an extraordinary beast much more like a communications receiver than it is a domestic radio. Although I've been told the performance is very poor and I have read that they were built badly, which is very odd indeed. Um, having never come across one in the flesh myself that I could work on, I cannot comment on either of those statements as to their accuracy. This is rather a complex amplifier and it's a bit odd. But some background about the decoder. During the war, the Navy needed high quality recordings of submarines to train submarine officers to identify our ones from German U-boats. The existing recordings were too poor a quality. Decker was given the contract to develop what became their FFRR, that is Full Frequency Response recording, Recordings, and I think they were successful in this and the Navy got recordings that were good enough for training um, anti-submarine operatives on warships, possibly on aircraft using um, sonar microphones, but certainly on warships. After the war, Decker profited from this by being able to produce 78 reproducers that were better than previous ones. Having said that, if you're used to vinyl, um, you will not think a great deal of the quality of the FFRR. It is still a very limited high frequency response. And being shellac for the 78s, they were very noisy. Although there were at the end um, vinyl 78s for a short period. So here we have a rather complex amplifier. I'm not the only person to think too complex. It uses eight single triodes. Why they didn't use double triodes for the first three pairs is another matter. Now, if we look at the input circuit, we have a high ratio step up transformer. You can't do that and get a very good high frequency response. You can in theory, but in practice, the amount of stray capacitance in the windings makes it impossible. This comes from a moving magnet pickup, um, the type where the correct term is needle, not stylus, where they were generally steel, although you could get brass and wooden ones, and you had a screw on the front and you changed them every few record playings, if you did what you're supposed to. By the way, the decoder was a huge thing. And in the bottom there was storage, I think for 378 records. If it wasn't 300, it was 400. And the whole thing is very heavy, minus having all those records in, which are themselves very heavy. So you've got a step up transformer, which is used as a phase splitter. So it's a center tap winding. It's got loading resistors on the secondary. It then has series resistors into the grids of the two valves. Now these are L63s, which is a 6J5 by another name. Don't pay a lot of money as a certain person behind the camera did for these second hand because they're plentiful. The L is low impedance. There's not a lot of gain in this circuit. You have some frequency compensation components here in the form of the 100K and the 0.01s. At high frequencies, the 0.01s may be deemed to be short circuits. Therefore, you have a potential divider between the 470K 
and the 100k so you get less than a quarter of your signal on each side applied to the grid. As the frequency goes down and the reactance of that capacitor goes up, the effect is much reduced until at base frequencies, basically this network does nothing. That arrow goes to what we call earth and correctly is the common or chassis. The grid leak is via the transformer winding primarily and again the earth connection there hence there are not grid leak resistors the valves have unbypassed cathode resistors now this circuit was described as neutralized and you've got these capacitors here from anode to the opposite grid on each side and you've got them again over here, very small 4PF. Now, to my understanding, this is not neutralization at all, and I have consulted a greater authority on this, being Dave Grant, curator of radio at the British Vintage Wireless and Television Museum in Dulwich, and also the founder of the Murphy.co website, also previously known as the Circuit Dungeon, and he has also said that A, he doesn't understand why they did it, and B, that he doesn't believe this is neutralising. I won't go into what neutralising is, but it's something you do in RF circuitry, mainly in transmitters. We have balanced circuitry all the way through here. We have switched compensation here. Now, there is, I believe, a fault in this circuit. This resistor here is 100K. And this one is a mega ohm. I checked the parts list and it says the same. I am fairly confident that this mega ohm is wrong and should be 100k because this is otherwise balanced circuitry from beginning to end. The switch tone control here introduces varying degrees of capacitance between the two grids. So it is a balance control acting on both halves of the circuit equally and introducing a greater amount of treble cut depending how much extra capacitance to this one here which is a 0 0.005 microfarad in series with 100k and what I say about the frequency response here is the same as what I said here basically it has no effect at low frequency but at the high end that capacitor looks like a short circuit so you get a potential divider between all the input resistors and this one here in this case not going to earth but to the opposite phase you can then add either nothing or another 0.005 or a 0.05 that must be fairly severe treble cut at that point. The valves have separate bias resistors and again they're not bypassed. Now if we go to the next stage one sees that there is a radio input that came from a transformer output on the radio unit and therefore it like this is a balanced input. These valves aren't needed because the output from the radio is at a high level. Not shown on this circuit and very ambiguously drawn anyway, there should be tiny arrowheads there and there. These little circles here are supposed to be the poles of a switch. It is shown with that connected which is the ground position. If you switch down to there it disconnects the input valves and gives us this input from the radio and exactly the same pertains on this side where that would switch down to there. So one then applies the signal to these two valves for amplification. Now again we have a um, balanced pot across here which looks very much like a tone but must be the volume. We couple into the driver valves 
again with the so-called neutralization. Here, to help the balance of the circuit, they have separate cathode resistors, but they're then joined together and go through a common one. This applies negative feedback. In fact, although this amplifier will be described as having no negative feedback, it isn't true, because not bypassing these resistors constitutes applying negative feedback. It also has the effect of increasing the output impedance of the valves, and it also makes them more susceptible to hum. So it's not a particularly good way of doing things. But anyway, this is then applied to these two that de uh, develop the final dry voltage to drive the grids of the PX25s. Now as a further aid to balancing the circuit, without actually having any adjustable resistors, they have a transformer, and yes, this is a transformer. If there are more than two taps on a, uh, an inductor, it is a transformer. It's an auto transformer. If these inputs are perfectly balanced and opposite, then effectively this transformer is invisible from side to side. But any imbalance in either signal level or phase causes the induction of a signal on the other side of the winding and in the mirror image loads the other side of the winding. So this is a balancing arrangement, rather an expensive one. A resistor, variable resistor, would have done it much more cheaply and without the inevitable problems with inductors such as leakage inductance and the risk of picking up hum and core saturation or non-linearity causing distortion. The output, seeing we've got directly heated triodes, is very conventional. They have separate bias, um, which they pretty well had to have. They have to have separate heater windings. We've got A, B and C, D, and A, B is one winding, C, D is the other. These are four volt windings. They could have center tapped the windings, which is more expensive. So what they have actually done is put resistors across them and taking the center point down to the bias components. This circuit runs at rather a high voltage. The PX25s have 535 on their anode, so if you get one of these amplifiers, do make sure you don't accidentally touch the HT, because it might be the last thing you do. It puts considerable strain on the insulation of the output transformer. There are much lower impedance valves that would have been easier to use, but anyway, they went for these directly heated triodes. This was made after the war, they had a choice of what I would regard as better valves. If they really wanted to use triodes, at least go for indirectly heated ones. They were ones available. Or to use triode connected pentodes or tetrodes. 6L6s will quite happily replace these. If you do that, then you need to have a six volt transformer to supply the current. And as they will need a bigger um, bias resistor, you need to increase this. I know of someone who did a restoration because of the price of PX25s, he decided he'd uh, wrap them up and put them somewhere very safe. He built a chassis with flying leads that goes over the existing amplifier chassis and plugs in. There is no modification whatsoever to the original chassis. Somewhere he's obviously had to have the additional heater transformer and he's got four pin B4 plugs that plug into each of the valve bases and he's used tri-connected 6L6s which work fine. Now with such a complex amplifier you might think it produces a thumping great output. Notice there is no negative feedback in the output stage, nothing coming back from here. It drives three parallel 12 inch speakers and the thing is very, very loud. So what is the output from this? Well, you might be surprised to hear it is a mere six watts. 
So down here we have the power supply, nothing much to say. Here we have a decoupled supply that feeds everything except the output stage. There is the output stage. They've actually marked the resistance and not the inductance of the choke. Considering what an expensive unit is, this is, that's probably 20 Henrys. 16 microfarads, clearly it's going to have to be 600 volts with a 535 volt um, HT line. Here they've got two 16s in series to get the voltage. It's higher on the input side from the filament of the directly heated rectifier. Now very strangely that's marked as a 5U4. Marconi did not make 5U4s, they made U52. Exactly the same valve electrically, but this has all Marconi valves in. So I think that's a slight modification afterwards. Something that does surprise me is that there is no voltage sharing resistors across here. I'd have expected a resistor from the HT to the center tap and an equal value there and probably relatively low value, something like 22K, and they'd have to be rated at several watts across a 535 volt rail. In theory, this doesn't work because the leakages aren't going to be equal and therefore the voltages across the capacitors aren't equal. Perhaps they actually used capacitors that were so highly rated, voltage rated, that it didn't matter if the voltage was seriously unbalanced, but it is very unusual not to have voltage equalizing resistors across there. Double wound mains transformer, nothing really to say about that. Seems to be quite a bit of wiring here. That's because it comes in and goes out to the motor. Only a single pole switch, which is a, perhaps a bit cheap. And this is a bit ambiguous. It looks like something you push it in and it connects all three. Well, obviously that will burn the transformer out instantly. Um, this is the traditional voltage, mains voltage selector. And one would expect there to be an arrow there instead of a bar and you'd expect these to be marked, presuming that's 200, 210, to 20, 230, to 40, 250. And that really is, I think, all to be said about the Deca Decola amplifier. If you found this tutorial very useful and would like to see more, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Patreon, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. So far to date, we have covered dozens of vintage valve amplifiers and equipment, starting with basic items such as Danset, Bush and Philips record players. We've also covered the Mullard 33 and the 510 valve amplifiers, the mic amp and mixer circuit based around the EF86, the Hacker and Dynatron record players, uh, Leak TL10, Quad valve amplifiers, GEC MOV division, Radford, Pi, Dynaco Stereo 70 and many other British and foreign audio circuits. We are in the process of shooting lots more videos on a regular basis and we will be uploading often. We cover hi-fi, musicians and recording studio equipment as well as vintage radio circuits. Please go to the website for more details.